Okay, we're back. 86, Generative Energy with Georgie Dinkov. Georgie, how are you, sir? I'm all right. Thanks for asking. Still afloat. <laughs> we were just talking about the really uh, fun subject of the death of Gary Webb and Danny Casalena and and the Clinton associate. So that's how that's how we kicked off tonight. <laughs> and Ivana Trump, who oh, was Ivana just Trump, ruled yeah. to have died from multiple blunt force traumas to the body, to the torso, not the head. Like, okay. I mean, this is really pushing into La La Land. Like, uh, I don't know. They're, they're just they're just laughing in our faces with, the, with those kind of statements. I mean, uh, uh, like, oh, okay, she was, what, is 73? So, so she's not that old, okay? And she wasn't decrepit. She was actually in pretty good health. So for a person like that to die from, like, let's say, if the the coroner found that she had hit her head, right, on a on the corner of a coffee table or something and caused some kind of internal bleeding, bleeding in the brain, yeah, that's believable. It's rare, but it happens, right? But to die from not one, multiple, <laughs> multiple blunt force traumas to the torso, not the head, and still be ruled accidental, what does she do? Like grab the hammer and beat herself with it to death? Like I just, I just don't get it. How, how can these things be ruled accidental? And uh, well, at least the CNN article just announced that quietly. And if CNN actually d does this, like announces something very quickly, like matter of factly, and moves on. You can you, you can usually guarantee there's there's more you know to the story. Um, so we'll see what happens. But uh, uh, maybe it'll happen just like that. Uh, what was the guy Gary Sherman in in Canada, uh, where the, they found him and his wife uh, hang, and then initially it was ruled suicide, but then it turned out it's a very or very professionally done hit. Uh, I'm not so um, I would have been surprised if uh, you know eventually something like that turns out to happen to uh, Ivana. Uh, maybe she was you know too close to Trump or uh, you know. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. But I don't think multiple blunt force uh, traumas to the torso uh, can be easily ruled accidental. Uh, you don't, you know, okay, if you fall down some stairs, right, unless you break your neck, you're not going to die from, like, the bruises that falling down the, some stairs will do. Like, in order for these, these, these hits, these blows to your body to kill you, they must be pretty severe. Like, somebody must have been pummeling her uh, really hard with fists or some other hard objects to cause basically internal bleeding, uh, you know, organ damage, especially liver, spleen, right? Um, you know, break ribs that can then like damage some of the internal organs. So this is no joke, you know. And from what I can understand from the article, she she wasn't ruled to have fallen from stairs. She and she wasn't ruled to have jumped from a window. So it's really <laughs> it's a very bizarre story, uh, bordering almost on the on the uh, bizarreness of the Epstein murder. I'm sorry. Uh, what did I say, murder? <laughs> His suicide in a cell where basically like uh, the, the ceiling is, what, 12 feet high? And there's almost no place where you can tie anything and, and his sheets are made from paper. Uh, so this guy has nothing basically to hang himself with. And then they find him with a bro with a broken neck in a way that can only be done through asphyxiation. Makes sense to Anyways. me. There is a – I used to be really into documentaries, especially like true con true crime documentaries. And there was one called The Staircase which was kind of like what you described the the Trump um, murder or potential murder, but um, anyway. So we're getting off to a dark a dark start. <laughs> dark? I'm, I'm I mean, just, it's just I'm one just person, person dead. Like I the know, World War Three is, is knocking on our door. I think that's that's the real darkness. I know, I know. What? Uh, well, we'll talk about that. Is there any new development that you've learned since the last time we talked? Uh, I mean, like worldwide or here in DC? Uh, either. Um, the crime continues to rise in D.C. The shootings are, are, are ongoing and continue to rise. Uh, D.C. is is uh, basically set to break the record uh, for violent murders uh, over the last. Basically, I think it's 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 on course to surpass the second. I mean, the the, the, the next highest deadliest year in terms of violent crime. I think it was like two thousand five or two thousand six. Mm -hmm. So what, seventeen years? Mm -hmm. So it's a seventeen year record. Um, and, uh, what else? Uh, I've noticed that, uh, Whole Foods is now routinely out of a number of products that seem to be made in Germany, mm -hmm. specifically the, the Gerolsteiner water. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's out in most of the Whole Foods, actually all of the Whole Foods stores in DC proper. I used to order it through Amazon, but basically now they're, they're out. And I went to several stores just to make sure that, that Amazon is not lying or like refusing to sell it online. Um, and they're completely out. So, uh, I'm tying that to the articles that are coming up on various non-Western websites saying that the German economy is collapsing um, and basically like their industry is, is drastically, uh, sh uh, you know, um, 
decreasing its production, both for domestic and uh, in international markets. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, other than that, um, I mean, it's pretty much the same. Um, it's just a lot of nervous people, like a lot of car accidents in DC. Mm. Um, uh, this kind of like I thought the peak was last year, like uh, in the summer of th- 2021, because then in the fall things started to like kind of kind of calm down. Now we're back up and actually surpassing 2021 summer in terms of road rage accidents and people basically like um, I don't know, like uh, without even hitting each other, somebody cuts somebody off, then this, the the uh, the person who was cut off gets out of the car, starts randomly shooting, mm-hmm. not even at the person who cut him or her off, mm-hmm. like just randomly shooting uh, at buildings and at other people. Uh, so that seems to be like those kind of ac- incidents seem to be increasing. Um, other than that, I guess it's, all, it's still the same. I had purchased like a hundred bags of oat bran on uh, iHerb.com. And then I went back to purchase more and they had, it had gone up almost half uh, or uh, uh, double the price. So it was like th- about wow. three bucks when I purchased them. And it, it was, guys, I'm kind of sick by the way, but it was, uh, it was almost $6 when I had gone back. And so, I, that, that, that will, that's like, I so I don't make that much money. That's pretty shocking to me of doubling something like a staple item. Uh, that, that sucks. <laughs> so you realize what, what, what kind of boatload of crap, the official numbers of 9.1%, which is shocking, yeah, yeah. shocking. The inflation is, this is absurd. I don't even know of, uh, show me one item. <laughs> <laughs> one consumer item that has that whose prices has basically r- 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 risen nine percent or less, right? Mm-hmm. So if this is the average, you must have items that are more, and then you must have items that are less, right? Or items somewhere in between. Well, show me those items. <laughs> I don't know of anything that that basically has had a price increase of less than twenty percent. Uh, and how can we have an inflation that is just still a single digit number? This is to me, this is insane. Um, and again, it's like basically shows you that. And then they're saying like, oh, the Fed may be forced to do something incredibly drastic about this. Raise the interest rate by 1%. That's the drastic action. <laughs> drastic action will be to raise the interest rate by almost as much as inflation is, which is 20%, right? Even that's not because inflation is higher than that over the last two years. Uh, like there was the guy Volcker in the 80s who like raised the rate, the interest rates to 20%. Mm-hmm. That will be drastic. So if the market is scared of a 1% increase of interest rates, it shows you what a complete joke and travesty of an economy the Western world has. It's all basically recycling fake money, which the, the central banks print. And then basically when this is over, like the, when, when, when this kind of cycle does one full cycle, everybody makes their cut, right? Then they need more money to, to spin it yet again. But there's no productive activity behind it. So I don't know. I, I I think hyperinflation is for all intents and purposes here. I don't think they'll be able to rein it in with, with these miserable, uh, pathetic risings of the interest rate of like, even if they raise it to 5%, it's still nothing, right? But it will cause a, they call it a recession. So I guess the Fed was right on time. Uh, what was the quote you posted on Telegram that the servers are ready to go? Oh, CBDC yeah. is, 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 is ready to kick off in like February 2023, right on time. Do you want to share the last thing you said to Ray on the on the last podcast about the it, is it ready to leave the cities? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I asked him like, okay, so so do you think basically like it's that's it? You know, the West is basically done, and I think I mean he's never I, I guess he doesn't want to panic people. But it's one of the few times where he basically his pause was not as long as I thought it would be. He kind of paused for one or two seconds, like yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, and it's like it's, you know, it's kind of time to leave. <laughs> start thinking about leaving. I asked him, like, is it? You think it's to start the time? It's it's time to start to start thinking leaving the city. He said, yeah. That that was the one thing I. I oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I said, and then and then we talked about basically like, well, what happens if the nukes start flying? He says, drive as fast as you can down south because. The radioactive wind basically will be the worst in the northern hemisphere. The, the more, the more, the further north you are, the worse it will be. Yeah, remember, maybe it was like two or three episodes ago. We asked him, uh, like, uh, do you think things will get chaotic citizenry wise? And I think he kind of said he didn't think so. I, like, I, again, I've been. He wrong. said that the, in the cities that he he thought they will have enough law enforcement resources to kind of like keep things under control. That seems uh, crazy. I, I don't think that's true. I'm seeing here. Well, of course, a lot of it, a lot of it is on purpose. The police is being told in DC not to bother mm-hmm. the people that are running around and carjacking and robbing and shooting and shot, et cetera, et cetera. Just contributes to the chaos, which they all want, right? The elite wants that, but not not a chaos to the point of basically uh, marauding gangs start running around 
and basically kill everything in their path, rape, village plunder, etc. Uh, but uh, there was a uh, interview uh, with I think the second guy in command for the DC police and for MPD, Metro Police Department. Mm. And he basically said, look, if tomorrow we have a large scale riot that involves more than 200 people willing to actually riot and kill and shoot, he's like, I don't think we can handle them. It's like <laughs> the police force will basically walk out. Uh, they've been, they're tired of being abused. They're tired of being told like, you can't arrest this or can't arrest that, can't do this. And uh, then they, when they do arrest somebody who's, if they get to the point of arresting somebody, that means it's a really egregious case. Yeah. And even those cases, the district attorneys has said that unless it's a murder one, he, he said, he's saying, I'm not going to prosecute it. I'm going to send him right back to, to basically the uh, social improvement slash justice system. Um, they call them the violence interrupters. Look, if there is a t- a thirty year old thug in front of you who's done nothing but crime his whole life, and and, and he he kills on a whim, I don't think sending him and uh, to the violence interrupters will do much good, except that he may actually end up killing those violence interrupters, and then may finally you know spur some some movement, some reaction, uh, some real change. But uh, yeah, so we got a situation here which is not uh, not very not dissimilar to what is happening in San Francisco and LA. I think over there, anything under a thousand dollars of theft is is not even record. It's recorded, but it's not prosecuted. It's not even like labeled as a crime. Nobody bothers with it. So here, basically, like uh, you know, the district attorney has come on uh, on record officially and has said, "I will not prosecute actively uh, unless I really." He kind of said, "Unless I'm really bored and have nothing else to do, which is not the case. I will not prosecute anything." Less than more than one, uh, even even like a second degree murder. He's saying, "Look, for these people, there's still a chance we can reform them. Um, a lot of them, you know, for a lot of them, the the reason they committed this crime, it's like racial oppression, racism. So let's deal with them with uh, the money. The city keeps pouring resources into these social justice programs and violence interrupters. That's what they call them. Actually, uh, the study just came out, commissioned by the city." Which tells you just this already the, the the study will be extremely biased in favor of the city, right? Of the program, but even that that study said the violence interrupters are useless. They're, they haven't they haven't they haven't prevented a single violent crime. Uh, why? Because they don't want they actually avoid dealing with the real bad puppies, <laughs> because those real bad puppies will show up to the meeting with a few guns, right? And and the way the moment you cross them, they'll start firing. You know they don't care about your stupid. I don't know, whatever you want to, you're going to try to wow, wow them with. I don't know, religion, family, faith, something like society, community, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't give a rat's butt about that. You can curse on this show, George. Don't worry about it. The, 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 I just Let's spe- keep it civilized. Yeah, okay. More civilized than the world already is. <laughs> I just spent a metric ass load of money on uh, security stuff, so cameras. And then um, there's something called the night lock. And so it's basically like a door barricade. You put it on the door. So even if somebody broke through your lock, they couldn't push the door open. Right. And so, uh, again, because I'm, I'm really worried. I don't I don't have like cell phone coverage here. So if something really happened, it would be all completely up to me to do something about it. And so I, I think the first line of defense is making the, the house seem like you don't want to go rob it, like having security cameras everywhere. And and they and the new ones are really good. They have deterrent functions. And so you could set up like um uh some perimeter like saying if if somebody walks in this area, you can do an alarm. Uh and there it's like pretty good, like the the new types of um power over Ethernet types of security cameras and things. But I, I would I'll, if you with me, I'll probably do the exact opposite. I'll make it look like a slum, so basically <laughs> n- nobody thinks that it's it's going to be worth their time. A slum, and then also like a, like a sinister looking slum that they know that if they try to get in, they'll probably get injured or something else will happen, something bad. I don't know. Two two uh, two different. If you can ways find a few fake human skeletons and kind of like <laughs> sprinkle some bones around and like some fake skulls, like look, well realistically looking, right? Sprinkle them around the property. And when people ask you, like, what the hell are those? And you just quietly look in, deep into their eyes and say, <laughs> trespassers. The dark episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm it, was, it was men talking cheek, but actually some people have done that <laughs> successfully in, like, African countries to, like, prevent marauding. And actually, I'm, I, and I do mean a specific example. Some farmers in uh, Zimbabwe and in South Africa um, basically have uh, resorted to these methods 
to basically uh, discourage uh, gangs from from trying to like rob the farm and, and kill the families I'll, that are running it. I'll go have to dig up a skeleton and then I can start that uh, line of my home defense. Um, well, don't, well, don't you have enough of those in the in the closet? Then is that, <laughs> is that the expression? <laughs> my my closet is skeleton free. Thank, thank goodness. But um, okay, we all, we all do. But yeah. I think at this point, like considering the situation, we've we've probably all made peace with our skeletons. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what? Uh, the the last episode of the Ray, I, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, the the protein stuff was interesting. I the audience needs to know that uh, if you listen to that, I kind of presupposed that Ray had changed his mind on the protein stuff, and I don't think Ray saw it that way. And so I want I sent an email to Ray, and I was like, uh, "Hey, I apologize. I didn't I didn't mean to like um, make that whole interview awkward for you because I, I think he thinks." And again, I'm. I'm kind of speculating here. I think he thinks that the low protein stuff is a continuation of thoughts he has already had about cysteine, methionine, and tryptophan. And so I don't, I don't think 50, eating 50 grams or something is bizarre to him. Uh, it was it was odd to me because I had never heard him say that low before. And then, and I'm not saying this because I think everybody has to eat 50 grams. It was a contextualized uh, um, discussion, and he was he said ad nauseum that he was doing it at, at for advanced age. So. Anyways, any, well, if any you uh, if you look at some of my posts on the forum from like circa 2014, 15, you'll see several posts about that um, essential amino acid MAP. Uh, there's a product that basically like, and I have a post that amino acid supplementation for people with bad digestion, and they do say that, and I think you probably agree with that. Basically, they're they're creating this mix of essential amino acids, um, and they're if you look at their product, it's kind of low on tryptophan and methionine, right? Both the both of these are essential amino acids, um, and and they're saying like basically like if you take that as your protein, um, you basically you can get by on I don't know like um, you know one one half to one third of your of like of your daily intake normal daily intake, which if you normally eat hundred grams of protein a day you know let's say on average that means with that with those amino acids basically you can get by on um, fifty to thirty grams of protein a day. Uh, which would be which would qualify as a low protein diet, and I think Ray's version when he says low protein, I think he's saying low protein because he wants to avoid those specific amino acids. If you can eat like let's say most of your protein to be gelatin and then the rest supplemented with the essential amino acids while keeping the uh, tryptophan, cysteine, and methionine as low as possible, you can eat a lot more protein. You can eat 100 grams of gelatin. And like, and then another like thirty grams of the essential amino acids, and I don't think Ray will have a, will have a problem with that because none of those activate the mTOR pathway much. Yeah, I so again, I we never clarified if that's what he was getting at. It didn't sound like that though. It sounded like he was restricting all protein. It did not. I could I could be completely wrong. Did you get a sense that he? Well, that's why I asked him that question. I said, like, basically, like, uh, you know, in some of those studies, uh, uh, you know, basically where they are doing the the caloric restriction, right? And he said, well, it's it's basically it's uh, you can you don't have to restrict the calories as long as you restrict the protein, the the amino acids that are activating that pathway. Uh, basically, you, you can achieve the same effects. Uh, not all of the not all of the amino acids activate that pathway. Um, some of the essential ones do. Um, I think the Braid, the branch chain amino acids are uh, heavy activators of the mTOR. I think tryptophan, methionine, and cysteine, he dislikes simply because of their anti-metabolic effects, with tryptophan being unique among all of them that it's actually carcinogenic uh, in and of itself. Um, but yeah, so uh, so so if you can eat, I don't think you'll have a problem with you eating as much gelatin as you want, as long as you have like a, a, the minimum amount of necessary essential amino acids. So I would, I would actually ask the specific question that uh, next time we, we meet, I'll say, okay, if somebody would eat, let's say, the low protein diet, uh, let's say 50 grams of protein daily, right, uh, of complete protein, w- would it be a problem if they eat, like, basically an additional 100 grams of gelatin a day? Would that actually, you know, put them into the high protein problematic area, which you kind of, you, you seem to be trying to avoid? My bet is you'll say no, you, they can eat all the gelatin they want, provided I- it's balanced by a sufficient amount of carbohydrates. Uh, yeah, that that would be the thing because the protein, even if it was gelatin, would be so, still be insulin insulinogenic, and that could still not really. No, 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 the, no. The with, the, with the glycine and proline, they actually have an anti-insulin effect. There is a human study showing that six grams of glycine uh, basically drop the post uh, prandial, which is after meal, 
uh, gl- uh, glucose, blood glucose response by 50%. Mm-hmm. Like it blunted it by half. So glycine and, and some of the other uh, proline and hydroxyproline and maybe even beta alanine, uh, some of those amino acids seem to be basically capable of filling in for insulin and kind of helping to dispose of and met- metabolize the glucose so that you don't need to release as much insulin as, as, as normally you do. Let me rephrase. Uh, when I've used the powders, the powder gelatin, I've experienced mm-hmm. wicked hypoglycemia if I, if, I, if I use those without enough carbohydrate. I don't think that's from a, from an ins, from the insulin response though. Uh, g- gelatin, uh, glycine can actually lower the blood glucose, and that's why one of the reasons why older studies use it for diabetes. But it's not it's not it's not the same mechanism as if you're injecting more insulin. Um, I'll show you. The human studies showed lower insulin and lower glucose response after a meal, which doesn't make any sense because you would expect basically, okay, if glycine, if that six grams of glycine lower the glucose by increasing insulin, you would have expected to see the high insulin in the blood. It, it, did, it not only didn't rise, it actually declined parallel to the glucose. So something in those amino acids helps the body utilize the glucose with less insulin. Uh, it could be somehow blunting the effects of cortisol, which rises after you eat, probably during the, the, the uh, probably because of the um, uh, rising endotoxin, which happens almost every after almost every meal, especially in people over thirty, mm-hmm. with compromised gut barrier, etc. Uh, so could be that, right? It could be so because insulin and cortisol they, they kind of go hand in hand. If you lower cortisol, you usually you'll usually lower insulin as well. That drug uh, RU486, the, the 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 abortion pill, which was actually developed as a cortisol blocker. It still is cortisol blocker, but uh, when they gave uh, they actually they now they use it off label for treating diabetes type two. And it shows you basically that when you take that drug and it blocks the effects of cortisol, insulin levels decline. So it's, it, the high insulin after a meal is probably, I mean, it could be just the amino acids. They are, the essential amino acids do have an insulinogenic effect, right? Um, but basically the uh, the high effect, the, the rise of insulin after a meal uh, could also be just that, you know, like because of the uh, elevated cortisol. And if you find a way to, to block the effects of cortisol, lower that rise in cortisol, maybe insulin doesn't need to rise as much. I don't know. Very interesting study, but human study and not that high of a dose of glycine. If uh, if gelatin is about 20 to 30% glycine, 5 grams of glycine, that means about 30 grams of gelatin would give you that amount. Um, so really not that much and a, and a really dramatic improvement in insulin sensitivity. Fair enough. Okay. Um Okay, let's move on here. Uh, you have a lot of really interesting articles. Was there one that you were very excited to chat about? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just speak whatever you want. I mean, like, um, I, there were some good ones. Let me read through here. Uh, what about? Well, maybe the exercise. Oh, oh the the one from today. Um. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Let's start with that one. So, um, I mean, we've been talking about this for a very long time. Ray has been writing about this for a very long time, kind of he's kind of saying, look, there's a difference between naturally slim without pre- people who basically seem to be staying slim, um, you know, they eat pretty much whatever they want, and people who stay slim through effort, right? The latter is not healthy, and multiple studies have shown it. Of course, there's multiple fake studies being thrown out there. Most of them association studies saying, oh, yes, if you run 10 miles every day, you're going to live forever, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it, biochemically, none of that can be true. Um, and, and basically, like, it's always been uh, – uh, basically, medicine has has uh, made the, the kind of like beg the question by saying, oh um, – a high BMI is bad, so anything that lowers BMI, BMI must be good, right? Um, and then even sh- have these shows, The Biggest Loser. If you remember the study, they basically like they they when they when they made these people lose a lot of weight in a truly stressful manner uh, through a combination of drastic caloric restriction and exercise, and then basically like well, after the show ended, oh, first of all. Most of the people did not lose enough weight with those methods, so they ended up drugging them behind the scenes, basically, <laughs> and, uh, uh, secretly, which many people um, told, uh, told the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, kind of told people that story afterwards, even though they, they signed a non-disclosure agreement, exposing themselves to lawsuit risk. But anyways, many of those people actually given weight loss drugs, um, and that's how they lost the weight. But a lot of it, there was, you know, they still couldn't avoid the, the you know, the regimen of, of brutal exercise and starvation. 
And every single one of those people that participated in that show that lost weight, not only gained it within six months of stopping that regimen, but actually shot above that weight by up to 30%. Uh, so whatever that thing is. So basically, yes, uh, you can say that with, with sufficient willpower and sufficient torturing of yourself, anybody can lose the weight. But can you keep it off? And first of all, why is it coming back? Well, it turns out to be a pretty simple answer. Basically, when you're stressing yourself, yeah, the catabolic hormones rise, adrenaline and cortisol, you're going to lose muscle, you're going to lose fat. Actually, first you're going to lose your muscle before you start losing a lot of fat. But let's say you persist and eventually you get to this catabolic state where you basically lose most of your muscle and your fat. And then when you stop, uh, cortisol, actually your baseline cortisol will now be elevated. Remember, I think we discussed that study where the expression of the cortisol synthesizing enzyme 11 beta HSD1 is actually two to three times higher in people that participate in long-term endurance exercise, especially running. Or even, I mean, cycling is a little bit better, but running, um, I don't know, like uh, uh, even boxing, something, well, boxing is, that's some concentric, but still, something that engages you in quote-unquote aerobic capacity uh, way beyond your glycogen levels. So after you start, basically it comes down to burning fat. After you start burning the fat and, uh, many people, many of the gurus say this is great. That's what you should be striving for, right? After you start doing that, you're already in, in the diabetes slash cancer metabolism. And over time, if you persist in your lunacy, um, as William Blake said, the madman who persists in his madness becomes wise, I would add, or ends up dead. Um, so you have two choices here. You're either going to hit the wall, develop some nasty disease, as many of us learn the hard way, um, and then you eventually wisen up and realize that it is actually something endocrinological going on that, you know, you keep gaining that weight. And this study said that people who are naturally slim, they actually are up to 30% less active um, than, than the other people who are exercising or overweight, et cetera, et cetera. And perhaps most importantly, uh, their thyroid, the levels of the thyroid hormone T3 specifically um, is basically much higher. Um, and, and that basically you have a, you have people who live a quite sedentary lifestyle. Uh, they do eat a little bit less, but only about 10% less, uh, than the, than the, the other groups. But the one distinguishing characteristic, actually the two distinguishing characteristics is actually they're not stressing themselves, right? Actually their, the physical activity is, is up to a 25% lower than everybody else while simultaneously having up to 50% higher levels of T3. Um, uh, and that's what, according to the study, explained the difference between the, the weight of these people and everybody else. Most importantly, so when you have this, these discussions with uh, people who are, you know, exercise fanatics, they'll tell you after you throw sufficient evidence at them, at some point, some of them will, some of them will be like, OK, I admit it. Yes, if you lose weight through stress, eventually, basically, you'll come back unless you keep stressing yourself. I get it. I don't think it's a good thing. But we're actually not exercising so much for the weight loss benefits. We're exercising because it, it improves a lot of the cardiovascular health biomarkers, cholesterol, triglycerides. Uh, C-reactive protein, all of these things. And it turns out that actually those biomarkers in the sedentary hyperthyroid people, I, they're not they're really hyperthyroid, but they they probably qualified compared to the people who are over-exercising uh, themselves. Um, compared to those people, the cardiovascular biomarkers of those people were stellar, the ones that actually were sedentary and were high thyroid. So, 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 again, so again, so the argument for exercise based on this study falls apart completely. There's nothing exercise can offer except temporarily make you maybe slimmer, but in a bad way because you're going to lose more muscle than you lose fat, right? Um, while in the long run, potentially not only making you just as fat, if not more than before, if you stop it, but also worsening uh, your cardiovascular biomarkers. Um, uh, I posted a study maybe two weeks ago, which could be in, in the list there on the first page, showing that uh, basically endurance exercise ages a male's cardiovascular system by, by more than a decade. Um, and when you look at that, it basically kind of hints towards cortisol being the issue, that the, basically the arteries of, of people, of elite athletes participating in endurance exercise, let's say marathon runners, you will th current culture thinks of them as the epitome of health. These people are, are skinny, uh, basically have no fat and also no muscle. If you look at them, they look like a stick, right? They're skinny, they're, they can run like 26 <coughs> miles. What's not to like? Well, it turns out that they're actually they're they're biochemically uh, these people are ten to fifteen years older, um, and and many of them uh, either quit because they sense like they can't do it anymore, 
or suffer a cardiovascular event during, um, you know, during one of those events where they're running? A lot of people that exercise a lot seem to have uh, really bad mood and personality problems as well. Something that I've noticed um, talking to lots of people. I, I think it's from the serotonin. Every time you run and, and basically like you jerk or you twist your gastrointestinal tract, mm -hmm. uh, the intestine starts to synthesize and release a lot of serotonin. Mm -hmm. 90% of serotonin is, is produced there. So anything that uh, physically, mechanically stresses that, that area of your body, it's going to generate a lot of serotonin. Now, if you like bruise your hand or you rub it or you do like a blunt force trauma, the redness over there, those cells can also produce serotonin and histamine, hence the redness, uh, but not nearly as much as what the intestine can do. And you don't, have, you don't have to hit yourself in the stomach to cause that. Just simply running for like more than half an hour is probably enough to cause it, which is uh, corroborated by the fact that if you look at the marathon, there's like they have these pictures of like basically marathon runners crapping themselves like while running the marathon. It's not a coincidence. It's the it's the basically drastic overproduction of serotonin, which happens in most of these people. That's what's leading them to have diarrhea while running. Uh, this is another Blake quote, and he, he says, those that put their bodies to endure are fools. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to be really clear here. Like, if you enjoy weightlifting, he's contradicting himself. The fool who persists in his foolishness becomes wise. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be really clear here. If you enjoy exercising and it brings some like meaning to your life or something, I, I, we're not saying don't do it. Or people that exercise are uh, all, like weightlift are unhealthy or something. We're saying, I think it's more contextually when a, a low thyroid person is exercising, yeah. it, it's usually leading to poorer health. And also, as I say in my blog post, like the mantra uh, is like the really the detrimental mantra, which I'm actually speaking out against is the no pain, no gain. In other words, if you're not suffering, it's not worth it. If you're not suffering, you're not going to reap any benefits. That part is pathological. That 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 should go away. Uh, but if you're riding your bike for 20, 30 minutes, if you're feeling great, if it's stimulating, if it's interesting, if it's fun, right? I mean, that's the sim <coughs> simplest way to put it. If it's fun and non-routine, it is probably doing more good than bad. If you, start, if you start feeling like you're pushing yourself to do it, if you're having, if you have if you had a long day at work and then you have to go on like on an hour bike ride and you're like, oh, I don't feel like that. I just want to collapse in front of the TV. It's probably better if you collapse in front of the TV instead of going for the bike ride. You're going to be doing less damage. Yeah. I've talked to actually multiple people that needed to exercise so they could go to bed, which is really bad. Like you need to go to exhaustion uh, so you can even go to sleep. But here's an old 1947, uh, 1947 reference. Uh, from Merck Manual, and they see exercise should be constricted until improvement is well advanced in, in the case of uh, hypothyroidism. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm going to die on this podcast, but my throat is so sore. Um, so let's uh, get to another article before I die. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, what you just said kind of leads right into reductive stress. And so uh, do you want to tie – what is um, – Aren't there two articles here about reductive stress? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. One of them is about cancer, and there was another one. Let me see. Maybe we could jump into the cancer one because you said, you said, hey, you can, uh, if you get the, if the stress gets bad enough and the thyroid gets suppressed, you can like immediately shift into the diabetes or the cancer metabolism. And so a lot of times yeah. somebody will say, I, I think I got diabetes. And so why is that kind of thinking not really correct? Like if somebody can slip in and out of this state pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, of, of the reductive stress? Actually, the, like the, the, the people with, with chronic diseases are characterized by so, the so-called metabolic inflexibility. Mm -hmm. uh, children are known to be able to switch from oxidizing glucose to fat pretty, pretty seamlessly without any problem. Like if a, ch if a child, let's say a 12-year-old child, plays a soccer game for 90 minutes, at some point they'll be burning mostly fat, right, while running around. Uh, but then as soon as the soccer game stops, then they drink their Gatorade or whatever other crap their mom gives them um, with sugar, right? Then the stress hormones go down and then they go back to oxidizing glucose. Uh, that seems not to be the case with older and or sicker people. And now we know we've already discussed that aging and disease are the same thing. Not even two sides of the same coin. They're actually the same thing. Just one of them is a more, more accelerated uh, like version of the other. Um, and this study shows that basically um, due to the reductive stress, um, because the cancer cell cannot really uh, now use glucose as efficiently um, and also cannot, cannot use the electron transport chain efficiently to, for anabolic purposes, to synthesize more DNA and RNA for its own proliferation purposes, the cancer cells are forced to actually start importing fats from the environment, from the blood, 
uh, in order to continue to survive. Uh, and it's basically the reductive, This, but this, because of the Randall cycle, as it's actually even the Wikipedia page says, burning fat, so because it, it forms a vicious circle. Uh, burning fat actually further lowers the NAD to the NADH ratio, which puts the cancer cell into even further, uh, further away into reductive stress, which means more fats need to be imported, and so on and so on and so on. It goes until... Basically, the fat, the, the cell, the cancer cell, quote unquote, is essentially just like the diabetic cell. It basically burns nothing but fat, and any glucose that even makes it to the cell uh, just goes through glycolysis, glycolysis, and the vast majority of it, of it is converted to lactate. Um, so, really, uh, it's it's basically it shows that b cancer, both as a disease of extreme reductive stress and also reductive stress. Uh, and cancer also contributing further to that re reductive stress. So it's kind of a vicious circle, and several diseases seem to be like that. Once you form the vortex, the pathological vortex of, of your health, it seems hard to break through because uh, to break out of it because these two, the two ends of it, kind of like feed into each other. Um, so you you have to be able to somehow break out of it, and one way seems to be to get rid of this reductive stress, uh, which is by either increasing the NAD or decreasing the NADH, right? Um, and, you know, several ways to do that. Uh, you can reoxidize NADH back to NAD with a quinone. You can raise NAD levels by supplying a precursor such as niacinamide. You can take thyroid hormone, which forces, basically uh, accelerates the whole chain reaction from Krebs cycle through the electron transport chain. So NADH is naturally oxidized back to NAD through those steps, while the quinones directly actually oxidize the NADH without having to go through that through, through those steps. Um, so, um, and the article hinted saying that basically, as soon as the cancer cell breaks out of the reductive stress, it commits apoptosis. Um, so, so that's the really the way to quote unquote kill the cancer cell. Cancer cell is so unhealthy since it's already acquired mutations. It knows it's deranged and actually it will kill itself if you give it a chance. The way to do that is by raising, I'm sorry, by dropping the intracellular pH ratio, which depends on carbon dioxide production, which depends on the redox ratio NAD to the NADH. If you do that, if you acidify the cell naturally through the production of carbon dioxide, if the cell is abnor is abnormal it will tag itself for destruction. Uh, you don't need to uh, take chemotherapy, which kills indiscriminately, and gives you a secondary cancer, or take any of the other measures that modern medicine has conveniently provided for you to happily commit suicide with. Or, or shrinks your brain. Do we, do we talk about that? How it like shrink the, the chemotherapy? The, yeah, like shrink the gray yeah. matter or, or something considerably. Anyways. And one study showed that one of the primary mechanisms through which it does that is by de uh, drastically lowering your synthesis of DHEA. Mm. But I'm thinking they, they only measure DHEA. <laughs> if they've measured pregnenolone and progesterone, they would have probably found that those are low too because I don't think chemotherapy selectively somehow inhibits the <laughs> enzyme that synthesizes DHEA. Um, it's, if, if it inhibits something that high up in the chain, chances are it's inhibiting the other precursors, the other two precursors, right? Uh, and probably increasing cholesterol. Something uh – it reminded me of uh, when Ray said we were. I think we were talking about DHT or something, and he, and he was saying like, yeah, for a big problem, you want as many things to push in the opposite direction as possible. Yeah. And I always thought yeah. that was like a useful way to look at it. Like, there are so many things. Uh, like, we live in a reducing. It's hard being an oxidized uh, person in a reducing environment, and so that's yep. why we need so many of these things to push towards oxidation and away from reduction because it's too. The stresses are so prevalent. That it's so easy just to uh, age on um, rapidly age in the in the environment we currently inhabit. I think that the two most important things one can do for neurodegenerative disease is take something that takes care of the unpaired electrons, right? Something like as a long term strategy, something like aspirin and methylene blue, or like vitamin K and methylene blue. Uh, I'm sorry, vitamin K and aspirin. Vitamin K and aspirin is is probably like hands down uh, like like a, a universal to me, uh, prophylactic, because vitamin K will take care of the excess electrons, and aspirin will not only take care of the inflammation, chronic inflammation, which we all have and drives all kinds of degenerative diseases, but vitamin, uh, sorry, the aspirin itself is pro-metabolic. Uh, it stimulates all of the aspects of the metabolic chain. Yes, it does stimulate glycolysis, but it also stimulates the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. And in high doses, it's also an uncoupler. 
Uh, so it will raise your core body temperature too, which is very, very important for all things, from immunity to cancer to to basically diabetes to cognitive function. Um, if you remember, like uh, maybe last year was when we discussed, uh, I had a study about raising, raising body temperature as a way to actually cure up to 40% of the cancers. There are several studies which Ray knew very well about those. Basically, if you heat the tumor to about 42 degrees, 41 degrees centigrade, it will induce an almost immediate and spontaneous cure, not remission. The tumor will disappear in a matter of days and not come back in about 40% of the cases. And in another, maybe about 30 to 40, it will shrink to the point where basically it's no longer a threat, right? You can then manage it much more uh, you know, much more easily with things like aspirin, progesterone, and whatnot. Uh, and over time, that will probably disappear as well. It's just a study did not last that long. Uh, so aspirin and vitamin K or aspirin and methylene blue, probably, you know, a universal prophylactic that addresses the two main aspects of bad health, such as inflammation and chronic reductive stress, which every doctor will tell you, oh, it's oxidative stress. It's, <laughs> it's not oxidative stress. All of these reactive oxygen species are actually reductants. They're, they're reduced forms of oxygen or its byproducts. It's not the molecular oxygen that actually withdraw electrons. Like all of the reactive oxygen species, what a poor name. I mean, really, like it's it's, it's basically <laughs> led entire medicine, entire fields of medicine astray by convincing people that this is from too much oxygen, which is the exact opposite. It's from like not using, not consuming enough oxygen or at least not using it properly. So yeah, yeah. aspirin and vitamin K or aspirin, methylene blue, and... You know, in some cases, even those, if you really have like a like a legitimately low thyroid function, you just don't produce enough T3. I I just don't think there's a way around this. At some point, you may have to supplement with T3. I think Broder Barnes agrees. He's basically said that once you reach a certain level of thyroid failure or like suboptimal activity, you kind of need that thyroid because you just can't really get back on your feet the way you were before unless you supplement with thyroid. And that was in the 70s when he was treating people. So yeah. they were, oh my God. And then, so the environment was so much better back then it, than it was now. I don't even think I could do this uh, podcast without aspirin. So I'm uh, great, great, very grateful to it for allowing me to have basic functioning while I'm talking to you, Georgie. <laughs> You should have vaccinated, Danny. You know, I know. Like I you, you thought it by running away to Mexico and not meeting with people, you're not going to get infected? I, I think I know why I'm a little under the weather, but I'll spare everybody and not explain it. So, uh, I think they can guess. Yeah. So, well, but, uh, okay, let's, uh, maybe we'll talk about ID Labs now because we've been talking for 45 minutes already. Uh, okay, let's go to idealabsdc.com. And I could give you a shout out. I've been using a lot of your, your quinone product um so the price oh, has not gone up that's amazing thanks for that the the thorin product is like 70 bucks uh i ordered five of these and you you put them in olive oil for me and i was using it yeah. orally for a while but then i switched to just using it back to topically and the one huge thing uh, that, go, go yeah and, and the one no, no, no. i mean like uh, people have told me that they they kind of like the olive oil version also topically i thought i strictly released it for people who wanted to use it orally uh, but it seems that some people say, you know what, I actually like it topically even better than the, the ethanol one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what you did really well in it is the thorn one is very slippery. The, so the MCT oil is very slick. And so when I use mm -hmm. that on my legs, you you I could use an eighth of a teaspoon, which is about 25 milligrams. And so if 10% is absorbed, I'll get like 2.5 milligrams and my leg will be like an oil slick. But your product is um, way more viscous. And so you can actually put way more on your skin than you could uh, with the Thorn product, which is more expensive and an MCT oil. So I think you hit a home run there. Uh, I will be purchasing more shortly here. I just purchased a grip Thank of you. aspirin uh, just for the future, you know. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks for that. Uh, and I purchased it at full price, by the way. No no special de deals here, nor did I want one. So thank you, Georgie, for doing yes. that. Yes. No mercy for you, Dan. Yeah, no mercy <laughs> on my, my bank No account. mercy for anybody, including me. <laughs> but what else is going on? With um, the uh, with the Labs, I mean, did I did I say we mentioned released a steroid uh, testing service mm -hmm. in nail and hair? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, some pretty interesting results are basically coming up. We, uh, um, you know, managed to diagnose a few diseases that people like they didn't know. But now we're actually finding out 
uh, that we may be able to detect other things. Well, we kind of suspect you, you it wanna, because you want to be the, real careful with your language there, right, George? About what? <laughs> Diagnosing the disease. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, our results spur people. Actually, I mean, I do. Actually, it's, it's thank you for correcting because we ourselves didn't diagnose, but based on the information, people got suspicious about having something. Oh, okay. Went back to the doctor, and when the doctor started digging further. It was confirmed through blood results that what we found was there. I mean, not that we found, but what, what, that our results were corroborated by the doctor when the doctor did some more specific blood tests, which is kind of the goal of this, right? I mean, it's basically, first it serves a kind of like a longer-term assessment of your steroid balance. And then if this thing shows some abnormality, then you may, of course, you always want to go back to your doctor and say, hey, what do you think of those results? I mean, I, I don't make any secret of it. I'm not saying it's just as a, as a disclaimer because precisely because this is not a, like a one-off thing. It's it's it, what happened. It measures things over the course of a, more than a month, right? So it's good as like a long-term indicator of where things are going or at least have been, right? Uh, but it doesn't tell you how you are right now. So if something is off there, uh, there's no replacement for the blood tests. Then you go to your doctor and say, hey, this is what seems to have been happening three months ago for a period of three to five months ago, right? For over a period of two months. Like, what do you think? And then the doctor decides if, if he or she thinks things are normal, if a follow-up is needed, etc. So by all means, talk to your doctor about this. So far, actually, knock on wood, every single doctor that has seen those results has been extremely positive about them. Uh, you know, they said, oh, wow, we've always wanted something like this to complement the blood tests. And in fact, they, several doctors said, you know what, unless you come back to into my, come into my office and you're about to fall apart and croak, um, I, I'm not going to actually do the blood test because I know very well those are unreliable. Many people have the white cold syndrome. You're afraid of me or you're afraid of the environment, right? Of course, I'm going to, I'm not going to, I shouldn't be testing your cortisol because I expect it to be through the roof. This is insane. So they're saying, I want to know how you really are in your natural environment when you're not meeting doctors on a regular basis, right? Which is exactly what the nail and hair uh, uh, testing should, should should be able to do. Uh, but now we've, uh, by looking through the literature, it seems like we, we may be able to detect many other things that are beneficial, specifically for related to like metabolic and mood slash mental health. Um, we can detect melatonin, histamine, serotonin, dopamine, epinephrine, epinephrine and norepinephrine, uh, which these two things combined kind of give you like a pretty good idea of how you're doing stress-wise. And specifically because, of course, these things affect your, your system as a whole. But as you well know, most of the mental health drugs are acting on the serotonin or epinephrine slash norepinephrine system. So the stress really manifests into the brain through cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, uh, and histamine as well. So you, if, you, if you manage to uh, assess these things, then you get like a pretty good idea of how things are not only like systemically, but you know, if somebody comes with a you know mental issue and then the blood tests don't show anything, but these things come back dysregulated, then you know, you kind of know the person is under chronic stress, um, or you know uh, have has have men mental health issues or or, or something. Um, so yeah, so we we'll keep expanding and not just steroids, but now many other biomarkers that I think. Even Ray would appreciate. I mean, he's written about epinephrine and norepinephrine and and even melatonin, which he doesn't like as a supplement. But it seems like in in people with good thyroid function, melatonin levels at night tend to be higher uh, than the than 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 in in, in you in you thyroid or like or hypothyroid people. And one explanation is that the body basically, like, in order to protect you from the rising serotonin with darkness because it rises in all people, the lack of light causes serotonin to rise. The, basically, the body, the organism of healthy people metabolizes a lot of it into melatonin, which is just one step away, and basically puts you to sleep, right, as a way of protecting you while your metabolic rate is naturally lower, or at least your, your mitochondria is not capable of working as well simply because of the lack of red light. You know what? We're going to pause for a second. I might have left the stove on. That's pretty much we're expanding the, the testing service to include other, other metabolites, other analytes, as they call them, um, that should be of, of interest um, because me measuring them in blood, actually, even though it's available, is very hard. If you try to, if you ask your doctor to measure your epinephrine, norepinephrine, histamine, or serotonin, the test is actually very expensive. Uh, you have to ask for whole blood, right? Many of them do serum, which is useless for all these things. And then the sample has to be immediately frozen. Um, deeply frozen down to negative 20 degrees centigrade uh, and they ship to the lab. That makes the test very expensive and and 
uh, quite unreliable. Even the lab will tell you that they don't guarantee the results because they, they don't guarantee that the sample will arise fr was was frozen as quickly as possible after harvesting and basically was kept frozen throughout the transportation process. Uh, so with this, with the analysis in nail and hair, that should be that issue should be resolved. Um, and then we'll just keep looking through other for other things to keep adding to the uh, to the things that we can, we can analyze. Um, I don't want to be another Tyrannos, uh, but at the very least, you know, I mean, we'll probably be able to to uh, analyze. Um, maybe I don't know. Um, one third of these things that she promised people, they will be able to analyze in a blood of, in a drop of blood. We'll probably be able to do about one third of those in in nail or hair, about the same size of specimen. Um, actually, slightly bigger, but still. Um, so we'll see. It's pretty interesting. Um, some interesting results. Very a lot of doctors that we're discussing with that we touch with are very interested, starting to send some patient patients our way. Um, what else? Oh, uh, I started uh, the lab in Taiwan has resumed business, and basically now we are uh, starting to do some more um, in vivo studies. Uh, and after the study with uh, vitamin B3 and B1 combination stopping that um, mantle cell lymphoma, which is a human cancer. Uh, well, but a xenograft model, basically like a transplanted onto to humans, onto mice with uh, suppressed, destroyed immune system. So now we, I'm going to try to do the same tumor, and we're going to try basically um, a completely fat-free diet. So we'll see what happens for about a month. Uh, I'm, I have some, uh, I have a feeling we'll get some very interesting results. And if that works, because the fat-free chow is still commercial chow, it's not the best chow. It's got a lot of iron in it. Uh, the 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 carbs are mostly from starch, um, so I don't particular I don't I don't completely trust the fact that they're not going to add there's no no residual poof or they're not going to add it later on etc etc. Cetera, et cetera. So we'll see. But if we get promising results, the next the follow up to that study will be several groups. One of them will get the fat free chow with some purely pure saturated fat on top of that. Uh, we'll get one which basically is eating uh, powdered, fully defatted milk. So it basically be skim milk on powder and then, again, reconstitute it in water. So we'll see how the mice do on that because it should should be able to drop to deplete their iron, with, of which most uh, animals with cancer have an excess, in, intracellular iron through the, because of the high ferritin. Um, so that's the, you know, that's the in vivo experiment going on. Um, we're also going to try, uh, we're going to do an experiment with vitamin D and K. A combination for several tumor types. Um, there is a, a study which is currently almost completed uh, at our lab in Bulgaria, um, basically with hamsters, and uh, it's that f f highly lethal, fully lethal cancer in in hamsters. It's not a human tumor, so I, the results are not as um, directly translatable to humans. But basically, we tested the uh, the serotonin antagonist that we synthesized, like sinanserin and. 10 methoxyharmalan um, and the uh, Russian serotonin antagonist tropoxin. Um, and it looks like, especially the 10 methoxyharmalan, did a great job of basically making the animals almost immune to being inoculated with cancer. Um, uh, I, I did a study with Corinon maybe like three years ago and showed that uh, typically the animals that receive no treatment get in fully inoculated, successfully inoculated, 100% of them by, by day eight. Um, and then if you treat it with cortinone, this is this gets extended to like day 16. Uh, and then with methoxyharmalan, actually all the serotonin antagonists had effect, but the methoxyharmalan extended the resistance to inoculation up to day 30. And anything over day 20 is basically, is basically considered that the animal is immune to the actual inoculation effects. And just because you kept po constantly poking it with a needle, eventually actually it succumbs. It organism starts becoming vulnerable due to pure physical torture. And that's what actually got it, got, got it, uh, you know, uh, s s uh, vulnerable to the, to accepting these, these, these cancer cells. So the methoxyharmalan essentially made the animal fully immune and only because the animal essentially was tortured for so long, only then the infection takes hold. But anything 20 days is basically considered a fully prophylactic treatment. Um, so all the serotonin antagonists past that 20 day mark with the methoxyharmalan going going as, as high up as 30 days. It, it, so we'll see what happens in terms of survival. Um, if the animals survive more than 60 days with any of these treatments, they're considered in remission. In other words, the treatments stop the cancer. 
Um, and then after that, we'll see how big the tumor is. There are ethical guidelines that we need to follow. Even if the animals are not dead after 60 days, if the tumor is more than, I think, like an inch in diameter, the study has to end. They're saying they are torturing the animals. But hopefully we'll have at least one or two that have smaller tumors, and then we'll keep monitoring them and feeding them normally and give them, continuing with the treatment, um, and then we'll see for how long they survive. If they survive for more than six months, it's considered cure. And what are the chances of the Marburg virus pandemic interfering with your latest uh, <laughs> test, do you think? <laughs> I don't think the Chinese care much about the Marburg virus pandemic. <laughs> uh, I think they're using the virus, even the current one, for political reasons. In, in fact, I think they're deliberately shutting down their economy to basically c accelerate the collapse of the West. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they're, they're using economics for mili not really nothing novel the u.s the west the west has been using economic uh, economics for military purposes for a very long time but now the chinese are doing it because uh, they i think they're this is their way of avoiding military confrontation which uh, unfortunately i think one way or another is coming because the west will actually rather see the world destroyed than than quietly go rolling over and, and collapsing right and then leaving the world power to the new eurasian bloc uh, or at least to the BRICS, but let's not kid ourselves. The, the leaders of that bloc, the equal partners are China and Russia. Did, did you see that clip? It was probably about a month ago when Biden was like the next pandemic, like the, later this fall or something. He <laughs> said something like yeah. right on the nose, like really specific. It was yeah. a little bit worrying. And then also, did you see Hunter Biden's, uh, what he had uh, Joe on, in his phone as? The name? No. He had him as... Uh, I'm going to get this podcast banned. He had him as pedo Peter. Are you serious? I'm, I'm not joking. That was uh, Biden. I've seen the screenshot. He had his dad as pedo Peter in his iCloud phone. Isn't that wow. wild? And then, well, I mean, after, after uh, to be the wilder part was the diary of his daughter, oh, which yeah. basically said that she was na showering naked with her dad at the age of 16 and was, and was highly uncomfortable. And a few other things that she thought the diary was like not, not the best place to express. How 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 much more obvious than that they want they want this they want this to get right? She's writing about her her being molested by her own biological father yeah. while she's underage, right? Uh, I mean, and that person gets elected and tolerated and promoted. I, I you know what the Chinese bring bring the collapse fast. Yeah. It cannot come fast enough. Yeah. I, I'm so done with this whole charade. It's just unfixable. You know, this is just, the the moment you try to improve things, and it's like from all directions, all kinds <sighs> of evil starts streaming and says, "No, don't touch it. We like it this way." <laughs> yeah, there's more stuff, but I'll spare people. Uh, you can go investigate it yourself. Um, okay, we should probably wrap up. Very recently, I do coaching on patreon.com slash Danny and I'm trying to take more people right now. So if you have been waiting, this would be a good time to sign up. And I'm super behind on my email, but I will catch up with everything probably um, tomorrow. And so I, I apologize to everyone. This, is like, there a way you can put in a website like that you're actually looking for people right now? Because there's no easy way for them to know when you're looking for more people or not. Sometimes when I they ask me stuff and I redirect them to you to sign up, mm -hmm. they'll they'll reach out and and then you have no no available spots, right? So they so I mean, is there a way for them to avoid having to ask you constantly? Hey, are you are you free? Are you free? Are you free? Go, go into this page is like really the only way I've figured it out. So it's patreoncom slash Roddy. But usually, I'm not okay. looking for more people to talk to, just because I I it's my business is hard to scale, and then yeah. it's really hard to scale when you're learning how to uh, plant trees <laughs> and other things because that is taking up all of my time right now. Like I I even came in for this because I've been working basically all day outside. And so I just, uh, I have t too much to do at the moment. Um, okay. But uh, that being said, I'm making an effort to talk to more people and falling behind. So maybe I should cool the effort. <laughs> um, okay. Let's talk about uh, one or two more articles and we can save these for next time. Uh, whenever we chat, because you have so many articles. Well, let's do, well, let's do one more because it's, it's close to 1030 and then, oh, you know, perfect. pick one that really like, um, Caught, caught your eye, caught your attention. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, the elephants, thugs grow up without a father figure. I thought was interesting. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, yeah, a lot of people will probably say, like, the conservatives, like, of course they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All of these bastard children running around, they're up to no good. They, they, they cannot be up to any good because they lack a father figure. Uh, well, if you believe that elephant societies are, are similar to human ones, um, or at least intellectually or development-wise, we're not that dissimilar, which seems to be the case. They're fairly intelligent. Um, they live in large social groups, but they're matriarchal societies rather than patriarchal, uh, like they said. But the role of the father, even in matriarchal societies, cannot be ignored. Uh, it cannot be replaced. So the juveniles that grew without fathers basically uh, became the poster poster children for uh, what the media well used to what the media used to write about. Basically, the you know the children, the thugs that grew up in broken families, and basically if they in life, what are they going to do? They're going to find it on the street. Um, well, in this case, they're going to find it in the bush. Or I don't know what inspiration they're getting from where, but at the very least, they're acting like complete thugs, attacking unprovoked, completely unprovoked other members uh, of their group, as well as other wild animals that are completely innocent. Not that <laughs> a wild animal can be guilty, but sometimes, you know, like uh, elephants, just like hippos, are very, very territorial. And, and, and another wild animal can get in trouble by just, you know, unknowingly encroaching upon the territory of the of the male. However, these these male elephants are basically literally looking for trouble. They're looking for somebody to engage with, for some for another animal to engage with and harass and potentially even kill uh, for no apparently no good reason. They're expending all of these all of these resources, which is very rare in nature. Uh, that's probably one of the reasons why most animals don't hold a grudge. It's just too energetically expensive. We are unique in that respect to, to the, uh, you know, as far as we know, together with elephants and dolphins, by the way, we are known to hold a grudge. And so do crows, the, 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 uh, bir the birds of the corvid family. If, if you harass them or if you somehow wrong them, they'll remember you years later. There's a fascinating article about that. And because they're small and they know they cannot really take upon you by themselves, when they fa see you years later and recognize you, they're going to bring the entire flock. <laughs> and <laughs> and peck the crap out of you <laughs> because you wronged them all these years ago. Right. So, anyways, long story short, the elephants are basically growing up. The fatherless elephants are growing up to be troublemakers, uh, and they cannot integrate into the proper animal and uh, the proper elephant society. And in the animal structure, overall animal structure in the environment where you live in, they always seem out of place. They always seem to somehow misfit, um, and. This leads to confrontation and eventually fights, uh, which are often lethal, usually for the animal on the other side. But, you know, sometimes when they pick a fight with another thug elephant, um, you know, often one of them dies. Uh, typically, fights between bull elephants during the rut period, they're not deadly. Uh, they're basically fighting for females. They may injure each other, but they're usually not deadly. However, between these elephants, very often they end up being deadly, which is another distinguishing characteristic. Yeah. Here's an so article. father's love, a father's love is a father's love and cannot be replaced. Here's an article that goes along with that. Um, it says, in mammals, prolactin is associated with learning, stimulation of immune response, reduction of body temperature, and increased corticosterone secretion. There's evidence that in families characterized by an absent or alcoholic father, young girls may be predisposed to develop a hyperprolactinemia later in life as a re reaction to losses. And so, that, I mean, serotonin stimulates the prolactin that could be involved in maybe yeah. the thuggery of the elephant? Well, I mean, if the SSRIs are now known, you've seen these multiple studies that I've posted, SSRIs basically make serial killers and generally violent and psychotic individuals. Um, it, there's little doubt that serotonin can cause that. So I think it's just serotonin alone, just by the lack of the father figure and the protection and the nurturing environment that having like two supportive parents provides – uh, that alone, just the chronic elevation of serotonin, is enough to turn the the animal into a violent thug. Uh, to what degree prolactin and, and, and other hormones rise, that remains to be determined. But considering that prolactin is a good surrogate for serotonin levels, if you remember that old article from back in 20, I think it was 2014, when I first posted it, prolactin is a very good surrogate for intracellular levels of estrogen and serotonin. Um, if you ser conversely, if your serotonin is high, it'll be very hard for prolactin to be low. Why? Because serotonin actually suppresses dopamine, and dopamine and prolactin, even according to mainstream endocrinology, are inversely correlated. Dopamine agonists, or dopamine itself, are used to treat hyperprolactinemia. Conversely, things that inhibit dopamine, like a dopamine antagonist and or 
a serotonin agonist or serotonin itself will actually uh, universally raise prolactin. I'm almost positive this is the paper. We therefore suggest that in-man estrogen and aromatizable androgen influence prolactin secretion, at least in part by involving the activation of the hypothalamic serotonin system. Yep. Okay, uh, we'll wrap it up here uh, so I don't uh, ha- hack out a lung on this episode. Um, wh- in closing, what, uh, what are your thoughts? Um, I mean, I don't know if you follow in the news. The, the, now everybody's kind of saying, oh, recession is coming. I think it's already here. It's been here since January. Uh, the question now is, is, is it going to be depression? And more importantly, is Europe going to collapse this fall? I think the U.S. has set things up in a way that the rest of the world, I mean, the world it controls, it's going to collapse before the U.S. does, right, it, 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 at least economically. But I don't think the system can survive because it's so interconnected. So if somebody like Germany actually has a, a true economic collapse, which is what they're expecting this this winter, this fall, and the, uh, it, it, which is guaranteed to happen <coughs> unless the war in Ukraine ends like right now, right? Negotiations start, and then August is used to like go through these negotiations and figure everything out piecewise. And then come September, the 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 um, what is it? The faucet on the gas thing is turned on again, and then gas starts flowing. Unless this happens, and it's not happening, uh, there's there's basically zero chance of this happening right now. You're looking at, I mean, the German finance minister already openly warned that entire industries in Germany will collapse. Um, so if Germany collapses, or at least one of the large members of the European Union collapses or has like a severe economic depression, I just don't think how the ripples of this are not going to affect the rest of the Western world. It's just effectively one giant corporation, just as that Reddit thread on Megacorp uh, recently proved. So you, you just can't have, there's no, nothing happens in isolation anymore in the Western financial system. If one country is sufficiently interconnected, uh, what they call it, of systemic importance. They keep talking about banks, but nobody has been talking about countries. And I think now the countries are in trouble. Now, if you, if a country of systemic importance, and Germany certainly is such a country, something bad happens this fall. You're effectively looking at the, um, you know, probably the open installation of fascism uh, in the Western world, and then CBDCs in um, early, I don't know, early 2023. Uh, I don't think Jerome Powell is joking. I think he's basically. Why would he lie that the systems are ready and you know and they'll be ready to be to, to go? They keep telling you they're they're going to be working on this, which really means in government spiel we have it ready to go. We're just we're just looking for the right crisis or a moment to implement it. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to the next episode of uh, America and to see what happens next on the the television show. So <laughs> that'll be very very fun. How is how is Ray? I haven't talked to him since the, I mean, I sent him that email kind of apologizing for the, I mean, I don't think he, he sent me back his gelatin article or something. I don't know. I haven't (laughs) talked to him. I mean, kind of leaving him alone. Like, uh, uh, I, I, unless some like major piece of information comes out, I think I'll leave him alone maybe for a few months and then we'll, we'll get him back on the show. But, um, I'm, I'm just, for the time being, I think I'm enjoying listening to him talk to Patrick Timpone. Uh, or his his other various podcasts he's going on. That's good. It's good. Uh, even though people don't particularly seem to not particularly like Patrick, because uh, he doesn't let Ray talk. He always interjects with his. What, what, does he oh, used to promote like monk fruit or something? No, yeah. Oh. Every other episode was something about monk fruit. Are you thinking of Andrew Murray? Because Patrick doesn't. Oh, Andrew. Talk, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry, Andrew it, Murray. Yes, yeah, yes, Patrick's yes. pretty low key. He, Patrick's funny because yeah. he doesn't remember stuff. And so it'll be like, why is the thyroid <laughs> good, right? That's awesome. And, and Ray will just have to like talk about, just rehash everything they talked about in the last episode. <laughs> it's um, like the movie Memento. The yeah, guy's yeah, like, yeah. you're the best friend I've ever had. Why? Because I get to keep telling the same jokes over and over yeah, and yeah. you always re- react like it's the first time you heard them. That's exact, exactly it. Uh, okay, Georgie, thank you so much. Let's do one last thing. Idealabsdc.com. And then patreon.com slash Danny Ready for me. And uh, yeah, so I will edit this. I will release it probably over the weekend or early next week. And Georgie, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Taking your ta- time out to do the show with me. Uh, thank you so much. My partner. Always a pleasure. 86 episodes. Pretty, pretty amazing. Wow. And uh, we have an amazing listenership. So thank you guys. Really appreciate uh, all the support we get every single time we do one of these. So we really appreciate that. Guys, have a safe weekend. We'll talk to you guys soon. Uh, Peace out.